So this is HESI um, under question review number two. You've already gotten number one. So here we go. <coughs> Again, as we're doing it, I'm going to go pretty quick with it to try to get you about out on time. So if any questions, don't be afraid to stop and ask me. I think between these 200 uh, question reviews and that outline that I've sent you, um, what I tell you with the outline, sit with a recording if you have to come to the recording. Just write down what those things mean, okay? So it's sort of like you fill in how you understand it. Professor think, Bogart? Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but every time I try to get into this cahoots, I can never do it. Why? I don't know. So like, do I have to get off the screen to sign into cahoots? Like, how does it work? You need to use your phone to go into cahoots. Oh, I didn't know that. That's okay. So go on your phone, go into cahoots. And I know a lot of times um, you want to play the cahoot game itself. You have to put yourself in twice because you need two people to play the game. So I know some students, you know, they're all at their house doing it together or um, they're playing with themselves on two different emails or whatever you have to put in there. Okay. All right, let's get going so we get out about on time. Pediatric nursing has a review number two. Multi. What are the signs and symptoms of pyloric stenosis? One, one, zero, eight, seven, two. <clears throat> So pyloric stenosis is always projectile vomiting, and you're going to feel an olive, or the, I call it a little marble, but the textbooks always say an olive size mass, and you can feel it right about the uh, siphoid process right underneath. But of course, you're not getting fluid in. Of course, your urinary output will go down. One of our biggest concerns is dehydration. Another multi. Signs of acute respiratory distress in an infant include. And if we look at these signs, this child makes me nervous, should be brought into the trauma room and should have an intubation tray immediately ready. You know, we'll have intercostal um, um, retractions, abdominal breathing, but when you start seeing that little nasal flaring with grunting, and the grunting is at the end of respiration, you hear a, uh, 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 that is telling me that is severe distress. Respiratory rate of 52 is getting up there, but you know, remember, is it the brand new neonate or is it the infant at two months old, which you probably have a lower sort of respiratory rate. So it's grunting and nasal flaring are the two big. Another multi. While caring for a child, they suddenly stiffen and have gave a seizure. What should you do? A child just had a seizure right in front of you. So we know we always turn them to the side in case they vomit. We are, of course, we'll time it and we'll be able to chart it appropriately then and pad, pad the side rails. And the head of the bed should be flat so we can get them on their side so they don't vomit and aspirate. Another multi, I guess I like them, huh? What may be a problem seen in an infant after open heart surgery? So 
when you had open heart surgery, your heart's been put under stress, right? So what are those things we might be concerned with? And this is probably a telltale sign that the heart's not beating adequately. You're going into congestive heart failure. We see that because they're not eating as well, poor appetite, and they're going to sleep easier. So they're not getting nutrition. And these kids, of course, are going to be on that low end of their growth development, right? Because their weights are going to be low. So I see a problem. The kids get fatigued, not eating good. I'm going to listen to the lungs. A young man who has cystic fibrosis wants to have children. How do you respond to that? You know, women have the ability to have children with complications, but they can. There's not anything physically wrong. Men are infertile, okay? Cystic fibrosis, they are infertile. They don't have vas deferens. They don't produce sperm that can get to, you know, the, the woman. Therefore, they're not having children. But one year post bilateral lung transplant, they can be able to have children. So that's what you would tell a man, okay? But women can, that's the difference there. An infant with tetralogy of fellow has a tet spell. What is the priority action? The kid all of a sudden goes from 0.2 stats of 100 down to 10, like my little Nathan did to me, one four o'clock in the morning, and he turned blue, purple, gray. You're going to do a knee chest and you're so quick to the side or up top or underneath, any way you can get it. And it's a quick movement because it'll change the pressures in the abdominal cavity and chest cavity. And whatever is holding that pulmonary artery from getting blood up, it, it, what I say, it pops off and then blood will flow. And then these kids do great. Another multi. The nurse should assess the infant with congenital heart disease for which early sign of heart failure. So, you know your child has congenital heart disease and your current concern is always, is the heart beating good enough to prevent you know, heart failure? Well, what is heart failure? Well, what happens, number one, and it actually is tachycardia. And that fatiguing earlier, like we said earlier, okay? Coughing is later when they're filling up and the slow, shallow breathing, actually usually it's more tachypnic because the space is filling up with fluid. They need to get oxygen. They'll be more tachypnic. But tachycardia, number one. Nurse provides instructions to parents regarding administration of digoxin. How do you know there is a need for further instructions? If this child vomits, it could be a sign of ditch toxicity, right? So we're not going to repeat it. Then we're going to be calling the doctor. Everything else is correct. You should never mix medicine with food. They don't eat all the food. How much medicine did they get? And then if they're missing doses, of course, call. And we're going to teach them how to take the pulse. Your child's been playing outside in a field and has long grass. What would be a priority? Like, what would you do? I mean, like, what are you checking for? You're playing in a field. <clears throat> <clears throat> and we're worried about ticks. Okay, ticks get in. I mean, we try to tell them wear long shirts, long pants, high neck, you know, if they're going to be out playing in areas with ticks. But if kids just out there playing, oops, I didn't know you went there. Let me check you. Head to toe, check them. 
A toddler presents with severe, sudden severe abdominal pain and a diaper has current jelly and blood stool. What do you suspect? What are all those symptoms meaning? <clears throat> so this is your absolute typical scenario of intussusception. Remember, if all of a sudden they have a stool, that means it's already come out by itself. It's it solved itself. But you'll see that current jelly and bloody stool in their underwear and their diaper um, if it's into susception. And the pain will go away. A six-month infant, six-month-old plants on thyroid replacements for congenital hypothyroidism. What shows you has been effective? Now, what did I tell you about thyroid and children? And what does the thyroid hormone do for children? And what happens if they don't have enough of their uh, thyroid hormones? They're not going to be able to do the things they're supposed to do. Uh, they're not going to, maybe, it might be to the point of lift their head, but that's severe cognitive delays. But at six months, they should be able to at least roll over front to back and front to back at that time. So um, something's wrong. That means let's go, let's check their thyroid levels. It's one of the things that we do. And remember, height and weight will be another thing. It has to do with growth, cognitive awareness and growth. An infant should be able to sit unsupported at what age? At eight months, they should be able to sit unsupported. Remember one thing about children's development. Not all children develop at the same age. There are some children at eight months that are walking already, okay? It doesn't mean the child who's only just sitting unsupported is less in development. It just means the other one was faster. There's no problem with cognition. As long as they're meeting these minimal goals, they're fine. A multi. What assessment would a nurse see with a child who is dehydrated? If you have a child who's got this, you know, delayed capillary refill, four or five and six, tenting of the skin, you'll see pale, sunken font nails on infants, crying with no tears. It's the saddest thing, and their eyes are sunken, and decreased urine output, and then vital signs, elevated heart rate, decreased blood pressure. These are all things you're going to see with dehydration, and we know dehydration is scary in children. Growth hormones are started on a child. What assessment shows that the medication's been effective? So when we look at growth hormones, we're looking at growth. Are they getting taller? Are they gaining weight? Are they at the level that we want them? So growth of two inches past year, absolutely. The rest, they're just part of development, but growth hormone is height and weight. One of the signs of rheumatic fia is chorea. What would you tell the parents about these movements? Well, we know rheumatic fever is due to a strep infection. One of the symptoms that we see is those chorea, which is those um, sudden not wanting like spasms of the arms and legs that they're moving. And we know that if we do the treatment, it's going to go away. The only thing with rheumatic fever that will not go away is heart valve damage. Once it's damaged, it is damaged. Okay. So chorea 
is just part of rheumatic fever. So do the treatment, it's going to go away. A mother of a two month old is worried because the back of her child's head is flat. What should you tell the mother? Yeah, we're always putting the kids on their back to sleep, right? So the hair is missing, the head of the bed, the back of the head is all flat. <clears throat> what are you going to say? <clears throat> so you're going to put them tummy time when they're wide awake because we know that bones are soft and malleable and they will reshape. My grandson had a big flat head and we were concerned, does he need a helmet? And the pediatrician just said, no, put him on his tummy. And it did work. What statement from a parent would be concerning regarding a child diagnosed with croup? Well, what is croup? Tr tracheal, laryngeal, bronchitis type thing, which means upper airway. What do you worry about an upper airway? They can't swallow, there's a problem. And that's a concern. Every kid with croup will have a barking cough. That does not mean danger. It's when they start not being able to swallow. Doesn't that sound like drooling of epiglottitis, which is the progression of croup, okay? So does that make sense now, understanding? That is a question, a child that needs treatment now. A child has myopia. What would be appropriate for a nurse to tell the teacher? What is myopia? <clears throat> so myopia means I can't see far. Put them close. Give them, you know, what they need for it to help. That's the number one thing that we do. Put them up close. A multi. A child's born with my myelomeningocele with sensory and motor deficits. You must be careful with what? What are our concerns with myelomeningoceles? Well, you know, at birth, they have this thing hanging out of their low back. We have to put normal saline on it. That was a question. With it's sterile dressing in order to keep the skin integrity. Now, we're going to be concerned about the bladder and not being able to urinate. And of course, catheterizations, make sure we're not using latex. And then it's the latex allergies with it. Myelomeningocele's, there's nothing with their lungs, and they're going to have sensory deficits, low extremities. They do not need aggressive physical therapy, just some range of motions. It's not aggressive. What interventions are needed for an immunocompromised child that has a platelet count of 10,000? What do you know about a platelet count of 10,000? Is that significant? So platelets are part of the bleeding coagulopathy. You don't have platelets, there's nothing to put the Band-Aid that will hold the blood back so it doesn't bleed. Bleeding precautions are number one. Doesn't matter what child it is. A platelet count of 10,000 is dangerous and your job as a nurse and your care plan is bleeding precautions. No IM injections, watching the CBCs, watching those platelet counts, right? Protecting them from injury. An infant was seen in the ER for a febrile seizure. The mother asks for baby has epilepsy. What are you going to tell mom? What do you know about febrile seizures? <clears throat> so every question, go in there and look for it. What are they talking about? So... Febrile seizures start from six months to about six years, and they usually grow out of them. And you cannot consider that they're epilepsy until they're two or more per day. And usually febrile is one here and one there, and they're not more than that. My grandson, the oldest, 
had one, that's it, and never another one. An 18-year-old parent wants their child's lab result. What do you tell this parent? What is our concern here? This is an 18-year-old's parent. That means the patient, the client, is 18 years old. Can you give the parent their lab results? Does it matter that they're mom or dad? Absolutely not. If they're cognitively aware and they can sign their own consent, you must get permission from the child to give it to that parent, okay? That's a HIPAA violation. And I'm telling you, parents do want to know, and you can't give it to them. What is Pavizumab or Synergist used for? So Synergist is the RSV vaccine. What do we know about the RSV vaccine? It's given from usually late fall, early winter through early spring. And it's every month. So it's monthly. These are usually your immunosuppressed or your compromised infants because um, RSV is a viral cold. But when you put all that mucus in their nose, if it's a cardiac or cystic fibrosis or a child that has no backup, um, this can put them over the edge and, you know, could create a lot of respiratory distress and could actually get them intubated. So they get that vaccine. What medicine can be used to treat an infant that's in the acute phase of RSV? This is one medicine I've, I don't believe I've told you about, but it's actually pink. It actually goes into an aerosol and it's given for viral. Which one of these are viral of those medicines? How do you know? And the OLE is your viral and it's called Vibrovirin. And that's what's used. And most of the time they just suction out and just regular saline aerosols, believe it or not. And then, you know, making sure that we don't tire these children out because of, it's hard to suck, swallow, and breathe. And then it's full of mucus too. What is the highest priority for a preoperative infant with bladder extrophy? What are we going to worry about? Well, what is a bladder extrophy? This is the low abdomen where the bladder is born on the outside of the body. And if it's born on the outside of the body, we always be concerned is infection. Again, we need to cover this with a sterile moist dressing to protect the integrity and sort of, sort of barrier on the skin, making sure that we keep skin integrity here until we can get the bladder back inside. A smart eight-year-old wants an insulin pump for type one diabetes. Is this a good person to put one of them on? You know, these insulin pumps, that means they stick one needle in, they hook up the tubing and have a pump and they learn how to use this pump. They say about 10 years old is a better choice for them. I mean, you might find a smart eight-year-old, but it really, you have to do some really diligent teaching. Because remember, insulin is dangerous. And they need to know how to check their blood sugars, how to give boluses. They need to problem shoot that pump in case of anything happens. So usually it's a little older. A multi. What would a line, why would a line test be done on a child? You know, in my career, I've seen a couple children be admitted and nobody knew what was going on. And it ended up being, they do the line test and it was a tick bite. And then they knew how to treat the child, but um, it's so obscure. We didn't know the kid had been up north, et cetera, et cetera. Because in Florida, you don't see as many ticks. It's usually in the woods type thing. But 
Lyme tests are usually one to two weeks after exposure, and it's all about ticks, uh, seeing if there's any tick. And again, examining the body is always what we're going to do when we're ever we're thinking that. Another multi. What assessment would you see after administering an IV bolus of albumin to a child? So IV bolus of albumin, number one, it's liquid. Number two, it's protein. We use this a lot in children with burns or children with hypoalbuminemia. What does the albumin do? It sucks out interstitial fluid and swelling and it goes into the blood vessel and it creates more urinary output. And because you've pulled all that extra fluid interstitially inside that um, capillary, that um, vessel, you're gonna see the heart rate come down too. Because once you get enough fluid, heart rate will come down to normal. A male infant is born with epispadias and they cannot circumcise the child, why? So they have to use that foreskin in order to do the surgical repair, that plastic surgery. So they have to make the tube opening, um, you know, all the way to the end of the penis. They're trying to correct it. And again, that's a problem if you're in the Jewish religion. A child is wheeled into the ER, leaning forward, drooling, no cough with severe strider. What do you suspect? What does that sound like to you? Severe, and I would call it inspiratory strider. Air doesn't go in. And when you see drooling and this strider, that is epiglottitis for sure. Another multi. A, to diagnose Duchenne muscular dystrophy in children, an EMG may be done. What teaching do we need to tell the child and parents about this test? As I told you all, I had a cervical injury, and they did this on me. And you just watch your arms and your legs move. It's like um, almost like doing one of those reflexes on your knee when your knee just leg pops up. It's your arm, your muscles twitch. Well, it causes a lot of um, soreness when it's done. So let the parents know. And what it does, it measures that muscle weakness. Remember, Duchenne is progressive muscle weakness. It's in boys, remember, it's hereditary from mom. And um, these children usually die of cardiac or respiratory um, problems as they're teenagers. Another multi. What conditions would you suspect on a newborn Down syndrome infant? Congenital heart hypothyroidism, two big ones there. Dysphagia, no. Can they smile? Yes, they can. Irritable bowel is nothing to do with Downs. Child admitted for persistent vomiting and diarrhea. What assessment is most important? Persistent vomiting and diarrhea. What assessment? Well, what are you suspecting here? Aren't you suspecting dehydration? You can take a pulse really easily before you can even assess any of the other stuff. So that's the first thing I would be doing, an apical pulse. Let me listen. Elevated dehydration. Multi. What information would the parents and child need to understand about empatigo infectiosa?
my grandson had it on the back of his leg. And let me tell you, it was moving and spreading very quickly. Very contagious. You have to have local and oral antibiotics and you will have these reddened scars, not deep, thick and pigmented. No, that's rare. Usually just a slightly reddened scars, which will fade over time. A multi. What is another word that is used to describe erythema infectiosum? This is uh, one of those childhood um, diseases. I'll tell you, it is a virus. Treatments, Tylenol, Motrin, liquids, rest. And the other name is you can see that face, it's slapped face disease. It's also called fifth disease. It is a viral infection. And sometimes they get this big red demarcated sort of rash and it itches. I had one kid who came in three times one day because the itching was so terrible, the parents couldn't control it. Kept bringing them in, they could do something else. And we did everything. What is the treatment for pertussis? What is pertussis? Has something to do with respiratory, doesn't it? There is a vaccine for it, yes. But what if you're not vaccined? You know, you're not immunized. It's azithromax. Remember, anytime you give an antibiotic for a child, always watch out for reactions, okay? And it could be on the first dose or the last dose. I've seen them both, and they can be quite severe. A multi select. What are some side effects to watch out for a child in taking antibiotics? I think you taking antibiotics, the same things happen, doesn't it? I think one of the hardest one on the body is cephalexin or Keflex. I know that that's one the kids always come in, they're vomiting like crazy, diarrhea and their tummies hurt and they need to change them. So all GI, watch about all the GI stuff, okay? That's why a lot of times they'll give some probiotics or something to help that tummy, especially a kid who has previous history. How do you get rid of cradle cap on the infant? You know, I've heard a couple different ways of getting with, rid of this. Um, one of the things I read was putting olive oil on at night and then in the morning shampoo it and use a soft bristle brush or comb. Um, this one is mineral oil, same things. And you put it on after bath and it will get it moist and you can slowly get the white crusty stuff out of there. It's not gonna be removed in a day. A multi. Postoperative abdominal surgery child has an elevated heart rate and respiratory rate. What assessment might you make from this? As in, what causes an elevated heart and respiratory rate after abdominal surgery? You see how I read that question? Because it's heart rate and respiratory rate, it's pain. Just heart rate could be dehydrated, could be fever. But when you see both heart and respiratory rate, that is pain. Doesn't mean I'm not gonna check and take an output, absolutely, but it is pain. Medicate them, give them more. A mother whose child is undergoing chemotherapy asks the nurse about her child receiving immunizations. What is your response to that? Can you give immunizations to a child undergoing chemo? Remember, they're immunosuppressed. They have really no white count at this point. They are very susceptible to diseases. So you're going to delay them for at least six months after the treatment, okay? And that's the safest way to give it. Because remember, immunizations 
you know, they're giving you a little bit of something so your body reacts to it, okay? These children can't even tolerate that. You have to wait six months after treatment and then give it. It's the safest way. What can cause rheumatic fever? I think you all know this one really, really well. And that's your strep throat, absolutely. Oh, your ASO titer, right? Is the anti strep listen titer, ASO positive? That could cause it. You could see it there too. An adolescent girl wants information regarding birth control. What does a nurse do? Can you give birth control information to an adolescent? And if you do, how are you going to do that? Hmm. The most thing that you can do is remember your opinion, keep it to yourself. You can say you should be abstinent. You shouldn't do that. You're not old enough. And they're going to say, yeah, I'm not listening. But give them information in written and oral form. Just what's out there. What do you want to know about birth control? Um, that is the best way. Because adolescents are not going to listen to you when you say no. They're trying to protect themselves, which is actually a good thing in the long run. Child with hemophilia fell down hard on her knee. What is the treatment? Well, why are you concerned about a hemophiliac falling down on her knee hard? What can happen? So we are going to get that knee elevated, rest, eyes contain, elevate, and usually the home factor is given. Anything that's cold, we're going to place there. And of course, nothing that makes your blood thin, the NSAIDs or aspirin. Good job, guys. A multi. How do you decrease GERD in an infant? Gastroesophageal reflux disease. They're spitting up, they're vomiting, they're losing calories, they're not growing the way they should. We need to keep that milk in their tummy. How do you do that? <clears throat> and the first way we do that is to give some rice cereal in the formula. They say it's five mLs per ounce. So if you're breastfeeding, you would make a little cereal mush and put it down first and then breastfeed. And that's gonna hold it down better. Or it might be opposite depending on the child, depending on situations, but burping them frequently and keeping them elevated, that also helps too, and never prone. Another multi. What is priority information needed during the initial assessment of an infant with a fever of 101 and a cough? Trying to get this child into a room upstairs. We're trying to figure out this child to place them properly, you know, and, and to take care of them in a proper manner. How are we gonna do that? Well, we always want to know their immunization status. Is this cough something else like pertussis? Remember, it could be. And that's highly contagious and it's very dangerous. Medications, we want to know. Tylenol, Motrin, when did they get it? Um, depending. Remember, only Tylenol to six months old. And then you can add ibuprofen, okay? And of course, always you want allergies. A multi. What precautions should be taken for an infant born with myelomeningocele?s Another question regarding it. Remember that my, the, the meninges and the spinal cord are pulled out and sort of like ripped up out of the back. So it's pulling nerves in the lower extremities. So you have decreased motor and sensation in the lower extremities, but it also affects bowel problems and urinary function. And again, anyone born with anything open outside is going to be a latex precaution. We don't want them to get latex allergies. I'm multi. A 17 month old eats with a spoon upside down. And the mother says, 
Is this normal? You know, kids just stick things in their mouth. It could even be the other side of the spoon. They don't care, right? Is that normal? The answer is absolutely. The kid's just, you know, has something he's playing with, you know? And yeah, maybe it will work. So the concern is, mom, why are you concerned? Okay? They're just playing with it. You know, they're trying to make it work. Sometimes they do it even to get you upset, to get your attention. 17 months old are very smart kids. You'd be surprised. A multi. How is juvenile idiopathic arthritis treated? So steroids for flares, okay? But it can't be all the time. We need to find a treatment that'll work. Um, NSAIDs is the drug of choice for pain control, it's anti-inflammatory, methotrexate, and then they'll add on things, Humira, Embril. I think I'm on my ninth different one, and right now it's called Orencia. Uh, before that, Remicade. Who knows? Just trying to find that balance. And again, getting them exercising. And they actually say swimming in the pool is one of the best exercises for rheumatoid arthritis, and that's what I love to do. A toddler vomited two times, is listless and irritable. What do you tell the mother on the phone? Well, vomited two times, but listless and irritable. What does that mean? Is this okay? Is this not okay? What are you worried about here? This child is, as I've said before, you can only vomit two big times and you could be dehydrated children. And I've seen it before. Get the kid to the ER, let them, you know, check them out. Cause remember dehydration is serious in children. An adolescent status post amputation for osteosarcoma is angry and blaming his parents. Why is he doing that? You know, and a lot of all those pre-adolescent adolescents that get osteosarcomas, boys and girls. You know, and it's normal. They're angry. They had a loss of their leg. They're very, very angry. And that's the way they're coping with it. A multi. How do you assess children's outcomes that are treated on hypo or hyperpituitarism? What do we know about hypo and hyperpituitarism? Well, it's one of the things that the pituitary gland works with. You know, I've said all the way through the class, every single time you see a kid, what do we do? We do a weight and we do a height. What are we looking for? Many things. Are they grown the way they should? Is the nutrition good? This could be the pituitary gland, the endocrine system. It could be, you know, um, your thyroid. All of these things are done every visit with just a height and weight. Same thing for these hypopituitarisms. A multi. To diagnose a congestive heart uh, congenital heart disease, a child must undergo a cardiac cath. What are the risks of a cardiac cath? A congenital heart disease means they're born with something. What is the, the risk? What's this biggest risk? The thing I always tell you, check it first. And it's bleeding. Bleeding is the big thing. And of course, we're worried about those pulses because little microembolus can occur. But most of it actually is that bleeding. There is no post-procedure fever. I've never seen it. Pain is going to be uncomfortable, but it's really not pain. The other two are your more your answers. A multi. An infant with a TE fistula, what should the nurse have at bedside? Tracheoesophageal fistula, an opening between the trachea and the esophagus. What are you concerned about? You're concerned about aspiration, right? You eat, goes right into the lungs. So 
you want suction at the bedside and you want the head of the bed elevated, right? These ch children are NPO, nothing to eat or drink because if you feed them, it's gonna go into their lungs. If they reflux is going in their lungs, you're just gonna leave it alone and then give them a pacifier for growth and development. How would you promote normal growth and development on an infant with esophageal atresia? And one thing I'm saying about this is this child is NPO and will be on IV and get IV antibiotics because they will be having little mini aspirations. Give them a pacifier. Pacifier is that so they can suck and self-soothe themselves. A multi. A child has been having diarrhea for three days. What should the nurse assess? What are you concerned about if a child's having diarrhea? We're going to be checking everything. Heart rate, blood pressure, urine output. We're looking for dehydration. A multi. What assessment findings would you see with a child with cystic fibrosis? I've got a little bit of spelling errors here. I apologize. I don't think it's soul. I think it's foul smelling. Pulmonary congestion. And then with the small intestines not getting the nutrition, you're going to see growth delays. They're losing fat. And you're going to have these horrible, foul smelling, they're almost frothy type of stools. They're horrible. A multi. What assessment would alert the nurse that an infant is in acute respiratory distress? I could add one more thing to that. Right, that would be grunting, would be the last one to end on there. We know tachypnea, they're breathing fast. They got retractions, nasal flaring, and then it's the grunting. Sleeping, no, respiratory distress, they're not sleeping, they're getting irritable. What symptoms usually bring a child to the doctor and end up with a diagnosis of acute lymphocytic leukemia? You know, my next door neighbor, she was 12 when I believe she was diagnosed. And these are the absolute symptoms she went in with. Remember, ALL is when your white cells go down, your platelets go down, and your hemoglobin hematocrit go down. And a lot of it is bone pain, but you get fatigued, you're getting bruising, maybe you have a low grade fever, you don't feel great. And that will lead up, you know, do a CBC. And that's going to, especially that fatigue, they're going to be doing a CBC and they're going to find it. A multi. When teaching a child about sickle cell disease, a nurse should include. You know, a sickle cell, we know we want to keep these kids hydrated. We want to keep those blood vessels open. If it's cold, we want them to wear proper warm clothing to keep the vessels open. So keep them hydrated. Take the pain medicine before it's too far gone. And then they say if they have a fever, 100.5, they need to get to the doctor. They need to call them or get into urgent care ER because they're going to need some sort of antibiotics because there is their autoimmune, they're immunosuppressed. They need help with antibiotics. A child is born with transposition of great arteries. What is priority treatment? So remember, you have the systemic blood going and you have the respiratory, the pulmonic, and they're not meeting because they're backwards. How do you connect those two? What's that thing that keeps oxygen going to the body? And it's called the PDA, right? So they'll start prostaglandins because that's going to keep open the PDA, let oxygen get around. 
they can wait up to a week, 10 days to do the, the arterial switch operation. They don't have to do this one right away. It's not that emergency. It's that prostaglandin is the emergency to get on, to keep that PDA open. A child with sickle cell disease goes to the ER with severe pain in her left knee. Priority treatment to decrease pain is what? Remember, what is the pain caused by? It's very small vessels. It causes a backup of all of these sickle cells. Fluid bolus will always be number one. Then it's something for pain, IV antibiotics and heat, all of them, but your priority is fluid with sickle cell. Multi, what is a VP shunt used for? Ventricular peritoneal shunt. Goes up into the fourth ventricle into the brain, behind the ear, down the front of them, it goes into the peritoneum and it drains fluid. Why? It drains the fluid because it's usually a problem with hydrocephalus. It's also used a lot with myelomeningocele's. They can't, you know, work with the fluid balance after they have that part born on the outside. Many of them have VP shunts also. What would you see with a child with autism? ASD. Remember, kids with autism, they're going to be there playing by themselves. They don't like lights. They don't like bright noises, sounds, and they're doing repetitive, repetitive, repetitive behaviors. Um, tying a shoe uh, wouldn't be a, a child, very rarely. They'll do those Velcro shoes on those children because it's hard to teach them. They take a lot of time to learn things, but it can be taught. Absolutely. An umbilical hernia has become hard and painful. What should you tell the parents over the phone? So they called you at the doctor's office and their umbilical hernia, you know, that thing that proves out that you can push it in and out. It's a lot of fun to do, but now it's hard. It's painful. What's wrong? You know, this is probably an incarcerated hernia. That means it's twisted. There's no blood flow going there. And now it's an emergency. So get them to the ER right away or the pediatric or the hospital where your pediatrician says, keep them in PO so they can do surgery. The other stuff, no, we want to get them there now. Um, and they'll do all those things within the hospital. Get them to the ER. At what age should solid foods be introduced to an infant? Six months, and we introduce them every four to seven days. How would a nurse examine a newborn suspected with cryptoorchidism? What's cryptoorchidism? So we want the testicles down and hanging as good as they can. Have them in a warm room. That's why the doctor always goes and checks. If we leave it up in the abdomen, the abdomen cavity, they'll die and uh, will not produce sperm. That's why we want it down. What acid-base imbalance is caused by hyperventilating? Now, if you look at your outline, there's four different acid-base imbalances, and they love to throw acid-base imbalance things on there. It is respiratory alkalosis, okay? Hyperventilating. A multi. A child is falling and a stick has scratched their eye. What should you tell the parents and child to do? So you have an eye injury, so it seems like it's pretty dangerous. There's a stick, something that's somehow gotten to the eye.
So you're going to put this hard shield, and actually they put them over both eyes so that the one eye doesn't make the other eye move, and they get them to either pediatric ophthalmology or to the ER to look at it. A school-age child has reoccurring dermatitis, eczema. What suggestion would a school nurse provide the parents? You know, this is something that does happen. Kids have a lot of skin allergies. You know, it could be to the point of eczema or psoriasis. You know, and when the kids are there and it's really bad, it's oozy juicy, keep them home, okay? Get the work sent home to them. Keep the child protected from infection and then send them back. The other things, no. Multi. Why do you give aspirin to a child diagnosed with Kawasaki disease? Kawasaki disease, vasculitis, systemic. We're worried about carotid artery, the uh, coronary arteries and aneurysms. Knowing those things, what do we need to do? We need to thin the blood to prevent clots and the aspirin is also an anti-inflammatory. So it helps. You know, there's no pain with Kawasaki. They have fevers, they have rashes, they don't feel good, but there's no pain with this at all. A newborn has suspected uh, congestive heart failure. What confirms this? Newborn. So they are just breathing so fast, but you see all of them really cyanotic and with crying, they see it. And that's a sign and symptom of it. Newborn child. We don't talk a lot about brainy new newborns. How do you medically close a patent ductus arteriosus? Well, we've already talked about how to keep it open with the transposition of the great arteries, right? What is the thing that we use now to close it? Endomethacin. Prostaglandins keeps it open. Endomethacin is an NSAID, anti-inflammatory. It closes it up, okay? A child post-tonsillectomy is swallowing every two minutes. What does the nurse need to assess? Look at the mouth. I'm not telling you to go in tongue depressor, but just see if there's blood and if the tongue is covered with blood. You know that this child probably has a bleeder. A lot of times they need to go back to surgery and have those area cauterized. I've seen them hemorrhage from their mouth. A child is walking on their tiptoes all the time. What would you tell the parents? Like not because they want to, or they're they're you know showing you they're on their tiptoes. They're just Always walk normally on their tiptoes. I had one of my daughter's friend's kid was doing this. And then she was diagnosed a um, little on the spectrum of autism. So get her to a neurologist, okay, to make that determination. Get them in early intervention. And this little girl now is doing so much better. How do you treat epistaxis in a child? Nosebleed. Apply pressure, thumb and finger, hold it uh, forward 10 minutes, fistal bleeds, go seek medical attention. They need to do something else. A multi. What might you see with a child experiencing severe diarrhea? So what sort of liquid comes out with the stool, with diarrhea, and what are you left with? So number one, any diarrhea, vomiting, you always are worried about hypokalemia. Good job, and yes, it's metabolic acidosis because the stuff comes out, 
in the stool is all alkaline, so you're left with acid. A parent calls a nurse to ask what over-the-counter medicine she can give her child that has welts on her arm and now is up to her neck. What can she give her? So you're not gonna ask her to do anything. That could be anaphylaxis going on. Get her to the ER right now. What lunch would you choose for a child with celiac disease? So when you look about celiac disease, nothing with bread, okay? So chicken, coleslaw, fruits, vegetables, eggs, milk, ice cream, sure. A multi. What treatment should you, a child with pain of JIA have? What is the type of treatment do you give them? I mean, when I have pain, what do I do? How do I take care of it? Now I'm a kid. How do you take care of a kid's pain? So it could be hot baths, it could be cold baths. I can't stand hot, I prefer cold, everyone's different. And says a drug of choice and distract your children and that works. Highest priority for a child with sickle cell. What is the priority with sickle cell? What are you gonna treat first? And it's fever because the fever is causing the inflammation, okay? And what are we gonna do? Get an IV in, bolus, good pain medicine, and we'll start an antibiotic, okay? I know it gets confusing with sickle cell, but fevers probably cause the sickle crisis. A mother tells a nurse that her infant sweat tastes salty. What should the nurse do? As I said, lick the kid and you will. You will taste salt. And how do we do that? We're gonna test for cystic fibrosis. We'll do that sweat test and we will find out. A multi, how do you diagnose hip dysplasia in an infant? One hip, the socket didn't go in, it's up top. It's not where it should be, it's up here somewhere. So you're gonna have one leg shorter because it's up higher. You're gonna see those folds differently. And then you're gonna hear that clicking, that positive Ortolani procedure. That foot points inward, that's more of a fractured hip in an adult. Why do sickle cell patients have enuresis? Because what are we doing? We're keeping them hydrated, right? To keep the vessels open. Therefore, more fluids, you have more chance of bedwetting at night. What causes acute glomerular nephritis? You all know this, same as rheumatic fever, right? How you treat it? Antibiotics, good job. A multi. What may be a problem seen after a child has cardiac surgery? Again, they just had surgery, their heart is weak, their lungs are weak, so it's all about appetite, fatigue, and respiratory distress. It's giving them that time that they need and then choosing other things for nutrition. A diabetic child is brought to the ER unconscious. Blood sugar is greater than 600. Labs are drawn. What is your priority treatment here? DKA, what's number one?
bolus them with fluid, and then you could start the regular insulin continuous drip after that. Good job. When administering indomethacin to an infant, what is the expected outcome? What do we give indomethacin for? So I said it's an NSAID. And this is the medical treatment for a PDA. PDA is a big machine, like washing machine murmur in there. When it's working, that murmur will disappear. That's how you know. The boys of a parent, the parents of a boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy want more children. What information should be provided? What do we know about Duchenne muscular dystrophy? X-link recessive disorder, male. We finally usually see it about age three. They do have cognitive delays and they're gonna require a lot of therapy to get to teenage. Multi, what behavior by the nurse should alert the nurse to request a follow-up for a possible autistic spectrum disorder? What behaviors? Again, what do you see? So you're going to see those odd repetitive behaviors, but again, they don't listen to you. They're in their corner and they don't really hear you. They don't respond to their name. They want to be in their own little world, like leave me alone, leave me in my cage. When an infant needs to be on enteral feedings, what can help to promote normal growth and development? Enteral feedings, tube feedings could be on those for many different reasons. Give them that pacifier, right? Self-soothing, they can do it, good. A multi-select. A complex child is complaining of muscle weakness. What could cause this? You have a child with many problems and their muscles are weak. In general, what causes muscles to be weak? What did I tell you about these electrolytes. When you're talking about magnesium, potassium, and calcium, especially calcium magnesium, they're all about muscles. And remember, hypokalemia can cause those crampings in those muscles and weakness. Very good. A multi. What teaching should a parent understand about a four-year-old with a urinary tract infection? I think teaching parents how to prevent them from getting infections helps the best, you know, instead of letting them just get another one, right? They have one, we don't want them to have another one. Increase fluids, wear cotton underwear, get a repeat, and continue all antibiotics until the medicine is all gone, not until the symptoms are gone. What is priority treatment for a child with cystic fibrosis to prevent respiratory complications? You know, again, we know cystic fibrosis is the lungs and we use all that congestion, and we know it's also in the small intestine, so it doesn't absorb fat, and you lose fat, vitamins, and it comes out with these foul uh, stools. But all about the respiratory is vigorous, aggressive chest physiotherapy and treatments, you know, postural drainage, et cetera. Keep those lungs open and moving. What is otitis media? And then I'll ask you, how do you prevent a lot of young children from getting ear infections? No smoking in the house. That smoke causes it. Also having them sitting up after, during and after feed. Having them lay down, it goes to the back of their throats up into their ear. What would you recommend for a toddler who mostly uses gestures to convey their wishes? 
So this kid, toddler, somewhere between the ages of one to three, but they're just using their hands like, I want more drink, give me more to eat. And they're not using words. Well, remember, speech, hearing are always connected. Do a hearing test. Good job. What prophylactic treatment should be given preoperatively with large abdominal surgeries? You know, this is something that we have found out during research, you know, in my career that we've seen. Number one, we will give a prophylactic antibiotic to prevent infections now before surgery, and it works. Also, you're touching these intestines and manipulating them. What are you worried about? It's that uh, vomiting. So an antiemetic is given, and it does help decrease vomiting. A child with ADHD is out of control and sent to the school nurse. What should she recommend? Remember, this kid can't sit still, is always moving, and obviously disrupting the class because the school nurse, that's where they had to go. What would you recommend? Well, number one, if they're not already at psychologist, to get them there. Um, and also remember to have a plan with the family. What do they need to do? Maybe the family's tried everything. So maybe there's other stuff, but you know, psychologists should be brought into it. An adolescent is asking for her mother to stay with her. Why? Remember adolescents don't like mom and dad. You know, adolescents want to be with their friends in them as I call it, their buddies in them, right? Well, no, this adolescent wants mommy, why? Well, again, this is what we call the regression. That's how, you know, younger kids start sucking their finger again or want a bottle again or a pacifier or need diapers again. Same thing, multi. A toddler's noticed drinking soda from a bottle. What should the nurse discuss with this mother? A kid's one or three years old drinking Coca-Cola from the bottle. So number one is that high calories gonna lead to obesity, dental caries, and they should be drinking from a cup by now, okay? So these are things that should be mentioned to help the child progress normally. Biopsies are not done before the remo removal of a Wilms tumor, why? Wilms tumor is under it's a tumor coming off the kidney. And remember, we don't even touch it, manipulate it, don't palpate, because that will put cells into the abdomen. There is no biopsy prior to that one. Number one, uh, three, number two, Ghana, number one. Wendy, good job, Wendy. Number two, four, Kristen and M with a love. Okay, we'll take all of those. All right, guys, thank you for hanging on. I know it was a long time being here. I appreciate it. Remember, there is a class week 12, not week 11. And I'll be sending that message to you all. Thank you so much. I will be sending you these recordings. If you can, come see me on Sunday, or I'll be sending that recording out as soon as I get it, okay? Professor Thank Boga, a quick question. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure if you covered this already.